uh, but sometimes he won't. And you got to be willing to say, okay, hey, I'll step up to the plate and take the hit and move on. Uh, that's exactly what you got to do. Take your Bibles and go to 2 Corinthians. Come across a passage the other day. Uh, I'm trying to not be as long as I normally have. Our clock says 10, 25. So the, the good thing about springing forward is you get a little bit more time until you get all the clocks set. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> It says right there, I put it up there, it says 1025. Lynn, Lynn had plenty of time, but he just uh, chose to give it to me. So uh, take your Bibles again, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not, uh, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not working, uh, walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sakes. For God, who commended the light uh, to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts uh, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels in the excellency of the power, that the, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Father, again, thank you for this morning. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for the song services. Thank you for Sunday school classes. And Lord, thank you for everybody that came out this morning to hear something out of your book. Lord, this is uh, your precious word. It's not mine. Uh, never has been, Lord. I claim it. Uh, Lord, I claim my salvation through this book. Uh, Lord, when I get to heaven one day, I'll be able to sit down and say, this is the book that got me there. Uh, Lord, there's no doubt in my mind that the King James Bible is the word of God. Every word in here is pure, every period, every punctuation mark. Uh, Lord, I even think the cover's part of it. And Lord, I think uh, you did exactly what you wanted to do when you uh, inspired those men to write this book. And, and uh, Lord, here we are, four or five hundred years later, holding it in our hands. And, and all the men down through history, Paul and, and James and John and, and Matthew and Mark, all those men, Luke, who wrote the Bible, Lord, who... Uh, we have it in our hand today and all the, the prophets in the old times. And Lord, they gave us something that uh, we could get through this life with. Lord, help us to see that uh, this is about you and not about us. And Father, we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' precious, holy, precious name. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this message is Why I Preach Jesus. Somebody the other day said that I guess a couple people while I was gone preached the message I'm preaching. Uh, my question is, why preach Jesus? Uh, I come across that verse there. In verse 5 it says, And we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And uh, whenever you miss, whenever you start preaching something other than Jesus Christ, uh, tell me the old, old story. I want to hear, hear something about him. I really could care less about you. I could care less about me. I could care less about just about anything on this planet anymore. Uh, I'm sick of us is what I told. I told Brother Peacock, we was down there, I went up and hugged him, crying all over the place, said, I'm sick of me, man. He goes, I'm sick of you too. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, you got to get someplace in life where you realize it's not about you, never was about you. Uh, we get through this, uh, the older we get sometimes, the worse it gets because we think it's about us, man. And, and uh, I mean, it's not. It never was about me. I, I don't think God ever cared really a whole lot about me other than his son. And he said, you want my son? I said, yeah. He goes, okay, then I like you. Other than that, I'm going to throw you in the hell. What do you think about that? I said, I don't like that part of it. I think I'll just take your son. <laughs> I, I said, the Bible says, for we preach not ourselves. I'm sick of hearing people talk about themselves. Now, you may hear me talk about the Navy every time. But that's because the Lord Jesus Christ did something in my life, and I want to tell everybody what he did. Man, I was in here Saturday, man. I almost, almost excommunicated Mike back there. He comes in, and he tells me, he said, the British Navy's got a new aircraft carrier, so who really cares? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what? What's that mean? <laughs> that means that, that down in Panama, I mean, can it get through the canal on its own? I mean, will we have to send one of ours down and tow it? I mean, that's... Uh, don't, they're a bunch of drunks anyways, man. I, I used to run with them. Every time we pulled into port, they were over there. Since they tied up, man, they're all drinking on the ship. We were never allowed to drink on the ship. Now, we could come back on the ship drunk. Not me. I never did get drunk while I was in the Navy. Uh, out in the ships anyways. Uh, but but uh, I'm telling you, he goes, yeah, the Queen Elizabeth, who cares? I mean, Queen Elizabeth's a nice name, but 
uh, uh, came. I said, no way, man. I said, so my son, Andrew, which is a blessing, man, he's over here on his, I'm on, on, on my phone going, no way, man. The, the Brits had no way that they got a carrier better than ours. I said, Andrew, what are you looking at? He said, he's looking at the, the Gerald Ford. So he has the Gerald Ford up on his little phone. And I mean, he almost needs two phones to get that on, by the way. Uh, you can't only get one of our carriers on one phone. You need two or three. Uh, <laughs> I could have cut mine in half and put theirs on that one, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, the Brits ain't got nothing. But I said, Andrew, how long is that ship? And he goes, 1,000, uh, maybe 1,600 feet. No, I think it was like 1,081 feet or something like that. 1,100 feet. So 1,100 feet, and this, this British carrier was, was like 970 or 80 feet long. I said, see? See right there? I mean, it's a little dinky thing, man. It's like a tugboat to one of our carriers. And, and they got this funky looking thing that goes up on the front. If you ever look at all the other carriers in the world, they got this thing that goes up on the front because they still haven't figured out how to launch a plane off the front without it sinking in the water. So they have to give it all the lift they can get this thing, and it takes off like a rocket off the ship. Ours don't. Ours, ours is top secret. That launching system is top secret on those ships, by the way. They, nobody knows how it's done. That's why nobody else has got it. And, and we don't even give our friends that kind of stuff. And they just throw the plane off. Now, that pilot is, number one, flying that plane, or he's getting ready to get run over by an aircraft carrier. Simple. <laughs> Bottom line, there's no other things. That carrier can launch four planes at a time, two on the uh, flight deck here and two up here. Or I found out it can only launch two forward and recover two at the same time. So as fast as we launch them, we can recover them, and we can shoot you down. Now, you say, what is it? That's the, the Lord did something for me. And he put me in a path down through there that I haven't been able to use my whole life. And it's all to his glory that any of that stuff ever happened. It had nothing to do with me. I went in the Navy saved. I came out saved. I went in the Navy saved. I met a guy, and he turned out to be a homosexual that was said he was saved. I tell people all the time, while I was in the military, I found very few men that could stand for Jesus Christ in the military. You know why? Because they're not preaching Christ. They're preaching their own selves. And then when you start preaching your own self, you know what you do? you got to protect yourself. And you don't want nobody to hurt you. So you shut your mouth about Jesus Christ. I never shut my mouth about Jesus Christ from the day I went in to the day I got out. I fixed everything that was broke so they had no, no, no reason to come against me. But man, you give me two seconds. If there was a rat that moved across the floor, I was telling that rat about Jesus Christ. They all knew I was a Christian. I'm sick of people who they don't know you're a Christian when they meet you. They should know you in about two minutes that you're a Christian. Amen. By the time I get done with this message today, you're going to know whether you're one or not. <laughs> you say, man, won't you ever shut up? No, I won't. Why preach Jesus? We preach Jesus not of ourselves. Why? The ministry was given. It was a given thing. It's about Christ. It, it was received. The ministry is about Jesus Christ. It's not about you. It's not about anything you have. It's about Jesus Christ. And received from him. It says in verse 1 there, it says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. It says if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. You know, a lot of people, they quit before they ever get started. They, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people even know how to serve Jesus Christ. They just think they do. Uh, women obey, women are, you're supposed to be in subjection to your own husband. That's a rough thing, man. Now, I'm saying that because, guys, you're supposed to be in subjection to Jesus Christ as, unto, as the church. Well, I'm supposed to, the wives should be in subjection to their husband as the men are to the church, or to Jesus Christ. It's a picture of the church. Guys, you say your wife ain't doing too good. Oh, how are you doing with Jesus Christ? Huh? You, you ask her to do something that you're not doing? Uh, it ain't going to happen, man. Uh, that's putting things in life. We seen we have this ministry. Paul, Paul, I'm going to go take your Bibles, go back to Acts chapter 9. Lynn's been going through uh, Acts, and uh, he got through this about seven months ago. I'm telling you what, it's tough to get through the Bible, man. If you, if you take it through uh, verse after verse after verse after verse after verse, and, and you do any time in it at all, man, I'm telling you what, it'd take you forever and a day to get through a, the Bible, and it should. I like reading my Bible anymore, man. It's, it's getting more and more enjoyable every day. And the Lord keeps adding more to it, and me and him's fighting. And I'm just going to keep doing what he adds to it. And he tells me they read this. I'm saying, okay, I'm going to add that to it. And pretty soon he's going to have me reading this thing every month. But that's okay. I'll find out. And my job, I already know what my job is here. You may not know what my job is, but my job is to pray and fast and read the word. That's it. 
Brother, the rest of this stuff around here, I'm not supposed to be doing this at all. You're supposed to be doing that. You say, what is it? I'm telling you what your job is. Now, see, you're part of this church, but you say, am I a Christian? Well, are you really? What's the Bible say? I'm not screaming at anybody, brother. I just get excited. Don't you? I sit back and say, oh, God, you ought to kill me before I come up here. You ought to kill me get me out of here before, oh, I'm going to go up here. I can't do this. And y'all start singing all those songs about lifting Jesus up and praising God. I'm like, oh, yeah, I need that. I need that. You know, I'm just like you are. You have a job to do, and a lot of you aren't doing it. We aren't doing it. That's why our country and our world's the way it is. I'm not just talking about this church. I'm talking about churches all over the country. But if, it, if the shoe fits, wear it. I told Scott Flood that one time, man. We came to church one day, and uh, uh, Larry Theophilus, his name was about this much longer. He's a Greek guy. I always call him Theo, Theros, Theophanopoulos or whatever it was. But anyways, he came in. Man, he was, I was sitting over here working the sound booth. Actually, the preacher was here. I was sitting over here. And man, this big old guy, the preacher told him something about me. And he's probably right, but uh, I didn't care really. Uh, I was a sailor, I could care less. And, and Larry's thumb, man, his finger's about that big around. He just shoved it in my face. Now, he's supposed to be preaching at you guys, but he's really looking right at me, preaching to me like this. So I kind of think he was talking to me. Uh, but <laughs> I didn't really care. It didn't bother me a whole lot. Uh, I mean, if you ever knew Brother Theros, I mean, he's a big old guy, man. He, I look up at him like this, and man, it's a big guy. But anyways, uh, he kept doing that, and the service was over. I didn't really care. Uh, I, got a, I got something out of it. I couldn't tell you what the message was. I mean, it just because it didn't apply to me. Uh, but Scott Flood comes up. Boy, was he ticked. The guy, he came from the back of the church all the way up. He was red to face all man. Because I'm so mad at him, Mike. I said, what's wrong, Scott? And I said, look, if the shoe fits, wear it. If it don't fit, don't worry about it. If God says something to you, then change what he said to you. But if he didn't say something to you, then don't worry about it. What happens is we get offended at the littlest stuff, and we think somebody says something, and it's all about me. Now, brother, it's not about you. Amen. It's about Jesus Christ. And it's about him getting glory and not you. And sometimes, like, I like John the Baptist. John said, I must decrease, and he must increase. That's a pride. Just about right after Jesus said, that's the greatest man that ever walked the planet that's born of a woman. John says, I, I know my place. My place is down. Down, down, down. You ever got put down? Man, that's a, that's a sad feeling sometimes. See, this thinking world, man, makes you, I'm going to get into some of that in a minute. This thinking world makes you think you should elevate into it. And it's about as perverted as you can get across the spectrum. I mean, you can't get no more perverted than this world. Uh, that's a wonder the Lord hadn't flooded it out. I mean, he could have changed some things and said, I'm just going to flood it out again. Uh, I know I said I never would again, but I'm going to change my mind. I'm just going to do it again. Uh, he needs to do it again, and I don't think he'd find another Noah on the planet when he got done. Paul's acknowledged, back in Acts chapter 9, Paul acknowledged, Paul acknowledged Christ is what he did. Uh, if you're ever going to get to the place where you're going to learn how to preach Jesus Christ, and that's for everybody, that's not one person in here, that's not preachers, that's for anybody, sitting in a pew, anybody, uh, you're going to have to get to the place where you acknowledge Jesus Christ. A lot of us never acknowledge him. We, we accept him. I heard an old preacher say one time, I'm, I'm tired of people coming up saying, uh, I'm going to accept Jesus Christ, but you still want to drink and smoke and do all the other stuff in this whole wide world. I say drink and smoke because that's what is prevalent in the country today. Uh, drugs, the whole thing. I can still do all this stuff and get away with it. But I'll take, no, no, you're just trying to get out of hell. That's all you're trying to do is get out of hell. You don't want to change your life. Jesus wants to change your life. And he wants to change your life for a reason because he's your Lord. See, some of us hadn't made him our Lord. I, I find it very hard, or not very hard, uh, to do anything pretty much he tells me to do. Uh, I may not like it, but I don't, I'm willing to do it, try anything once or twice until I'm dead. Uh, if I can't do it no more, then that's one thing. I'll try anything that he tells me to try. Why? Because he's my Lord. Amen. He is my Lord. Uh, he, I don't care what you do. I care what I do. Uh, if you don't want to do it, I tell everybody, if you don't want to do it, fine. Go somewhere else or go sit down and watch because I'm going to do it. If the Lord tells me what to do, I'm going to give everything I got to do what he told me to do. I don't care if it hurts. I fell off scaffolding up here. He told me to put this 20 foot on. I put the 20 foot on. I said, I, I fell down. George laughed at me. I mean, that's enough to make you quit right there. I got back up with two broken ribs and got, don't tell me you can't do something. I got a witness. I was not going to let George tell me, you quit, you whiny cry baby. Connie, Connie normally, Connie, Lynn's wife, normally, I mean, if you go up and tell her, I've got a splinter, she sends you to the emergency room. And you come out there looking like the mummy. <laughs> if you go, if, I mean, if you get a zit, she sends you to the emergency room. 
We went down to Florida, and Beth tripped and, and hurt her ankle. And I told her, I said, you better be glad we're not in, in Dayton because Connie would have you in traction. <laughs> Before you got out of the church. Yeah, me on the other hand, I fall and break two ribs, and I'm all busted up like this. And she says, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> She never once told me to go to the emergency room. She just said, is a bone sticking out? Well, no. Are you bleeding out your mouth? No. Then ain't nothing we can do for you. I'm like, where's the compassion at? Aren't you supposed to, like, have, don't they teach you somewhere in nursing school? Oh, poor Mike. He's, he's not feeling good. Not even none of that stuff, man. And then I get George going, oh, and I'm going, <laughs> That's what you get for serving Jesus Christ. But that's okay. You know what you do? I think sometimes the Lord does that stuff in our lives to see if you're going to quit. He says right there, he says, we faint not. Faint not. If he tells you something to do, then you do what he tells you until you drag. You do what he tells you until you can't do it no more, and then get somebody to drag you the rest of the way. You don't quit. Some of us, we don't know what he ever asked us. Do you know what Paul? Paul knew what the Lord wanted him to do. It says, Acts chapter 9, watch how Paul dealt with this thing. It says, and he fell to the earth. This is after uh, he's out there killing Christians and doing all kinds of stuff. He gets letters to go to Damascus to get some more of them. Uh, I mean, he's doing exactly what he thinks God wants him to do. Uh, you know, I think there's some people who do what God wants them to do or think that they're doing what God wants them to do until they come up to face-to-face -to -face with Jesus Christ. Then they realize they're doing wrong. And you've got two options at that point. You can heed what he says or you can run. Paul is not about to run. I like Paul. That's why God let him write 14 New Testament books. If you ever want to do something for God, you better get a hold of the Pauline epistles, and you better look at the character of this man, and you better model your life around this. Ladies, you better do the same thing. You say, he's a guy. He said, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. You better look at that guy, and see, that guy got out of his life anything that was displeasing to God or was a problem to anybody else around him. If you walked up and you had a problem, if you had something, if he had something in his life that was going to affect somebody around him, he quit doing what he did, even if it wasn't a problem. He was not going to be a stumbling block to anybody else. You stumbling block to anybody today? Is what you do cause somebody else to stumble? Young people, you know what the danger you got today is watching this world out there. Because you get two different things. And you're sitting there going, what should I do? What should I do? You know what my job is? Is to bring Jesus Christ so real in front of you that when you make that decision, you know you're wrong. I want you to know you're wrong when you make that decision. I'll still be here and I'll still love you when you come back. But I want you to, if you come back. But I say, I'm telling you what, most people don't. They don't do it. They get out there and the next thing you know, they're destroyed. He said there, Paul says, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul. Could you imagine God talking to you? I could not even imagine him. Mike, Mike. I'm like, oh, man, just the sound of that voice would curl you up on the ground. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul said, who are thou, Lord? Question mark. Who are you? I know you're somebody different. I know you're not, not like everybody else because nobody's ever knocked me down like you just knocked me down with a voice. And I, don't, I said, who are you, Lord? I have no, but you're somebody bigger than I am, so I'm going to call you Lord. Wives, that's what you ought to do. I'm still trying to get Beth to call me Lord at the house. Man, she won't do it. But I tell you what now, I tell you what. I'll lay on the chair, and she will come over there in a heartbeat and put a blanket on me. She will make sure I am toasty wherever I'm at. I mean, she takes care of me beyond a shadow of a doubt. I can't even tell you how well that girl takes care I never asked her to do that. I asked her the other day, I said, why do you do that? Because I want to. What do you do for just because you want to? Ladies, you know how you can be a blessing to Jesus Christ? Be a blessing to your husband. Your husband. Not anybody else's, yours. If you're a blessing to your husband, you know what you are? You're a blessing to Jesus Christ. That's the task he gave you. Sorry, can't help you. If I was a girl, that would be the task he gave me, but I'm not. Ha <laughs> ha. He just told me to fall off scaffolds and break ribs. <laughs> he didn't ask you to go down a ditch. That's what he asked us to do. That's each one of us has got our own burden. I mean, we, if the guy, if the man is doing the right thing, he'll have just as much pain and agony as you think you have. Believe me. But if you ever call your husband Lord, Lord, what can I get for you? She hadn't quite done that yet, but I'm working on it. She's, she's my daughter. I see I'm trying. I got four girls, and she's not setting a very good example before those. So y'all help me there. Y'all pray for that. Keep that in prayer in Jesus' name. 
Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. You know what's hard to kick against Jesus Christ? You gotta, you gotta want to, to not serve Jesus Christ. Uh, he says, I am not a respecter of any person. He has done everything. God has, the Holy Spirit, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost has done everything in the world to get us to serve him. Don't tell me he has not. He has done everything in the world to get you to serve him. Everything. Everything. We have rejected it. If you're not serving Jesus Christ today, you know why you're not serving Jesus Christ today? Because you don't want to. It's that simple. I'll tell you what, a jet freeze is right down the street from me. If I wanted a jet freeze, I'd be right down there getting one. And I tell you, I've been down there getting them. <laughs> My wife now is keeping me from doing it. She's making me jello every night. Jello, man. I'm getting to like jello. I don't like the green jello, just the red and the strawberry and the raspberry and the cherry <laughs> with lots of cool whip on top. <laughs> I gotta add some flavor in there, man. But I gotta lose some weight, man. I really do. Y'all pray for me. But, but he's sitting there and says, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Yeah, it is. You keep kicking, and you keep kicking, and you keep kicking, and you'll keep kicking, and one of these days it won't be hard anymore. Because Jesus will move out of the way. And he won't be there anymore for you to kick. But he, he's got some mercy, man. Up here it says the ministry was given. It says in that very first verse, therefore seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy. You know, you've got to have some mercy to serve Jesus Christ. Because you've got to get over yourself. And the hardest thing for us to do, because we think it's all about us, we think not. He says, and the next, in verse 6 there, Paul starts talking after he got knocked down. This is just after he got saved. I, don't, I think he almost got saved right here. There's debate over that. Uh, but within the next couple of verses, he's definitely saved. It says, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, comma. It changed between the, the other verse and here. Something's changed. Lord, comma, Lord. Lord, what will thou have me to do, question mark? I will do what you tell me. Before, he didn't know who he was. Within a verse, he now knows who he is. He said, I'm Jesus, whom thou person. Okay, Lord, what do you want? What do you want? I'll do whatever you want. Paul changed his life just like that. You know, the hardest thing for us to do is change our lives because we just think that we got to have what we want. That's not, Jesus is not Lord of your life. You're, you got him. Uh, I heard old preacher say, he said this, he goes, me and the Lord, or me or mine or Jesus. Uh, you can, he says, you can't serve God and mammon. Sometimes you got to throw you out. Amen. It's you or him, you or him, not you and him. A lot of times we want to bring Jesus into our lives and we want to keep all that wicked, filthy trash in our lives. And we want Jesus to be partaker of that. And he goes, no, I mean the Lord of your life. Now, I'm not preaching a lordship gospel. I, don't, I think it's insane, but I'm telling you. He's either Lord of your life or he's not. You either give him, and I'm telling you, brother, it's a struggle. It's going to be a struggle to let him, when he says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not unto thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That means he will tell you where to put your next foot. You don't tell him where you're going to put your foot. He tells you. You say, well... I'm already in a bad place and I shouldn't be. What do you do? You stop. And he'll say, he'll, he may tell you to back up. He may tell you to go to the right. He may, tell you to, he may tell you to keep on going. I don't have no idea what he'll tell you. I just know one thing. Sometimes we make decisions. You're in this room today and you made a decision and you got into a mess. And the mess is, whether it's financial, whether it's, uh, I, don't care whether, I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter. Most, almost all our problems today, just about anybody you talk to is financials, financial or drugs or alcohol or one of these things. Uh, no matter what you get yourself into, you got yourself into that. I don't blame anybody. When I got saved, I told Jesus Christ, I said, Lord, I said, I don't blame you for nothing. I did it all myself. I said, I did every bit of that myself. I sit on my back porch. I don't tell, see, people try to tell me stuff all the time. Uh, yeah, you, you're, you're, you ought to be thankful that you're sitting in a church today, and you can come, and there's a Sunday school class, and Lynn is sitting in here teaching Sunday school. If you're not here, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to be thankful. You ought to thank God that there's a place you can come to and you can hear the word of God because there was a day when I didn't even know where to go to hear that. And if it wasn't for Jesus Christ laying a Bible in my attic and me going up there and finding that Bible in my attic, I'd probably still be sitting still in Louisville, Kentucky today, a mess, or I'd be dead. 
But he had mercy on me, and he put that Bible up in my attic somehow, and I found that thing, and I started reading it because there wasn't no stinking Christians coming around telling me about it. I knew a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses and some Mormons come around then, but I didn't see no Christians come to my door and knock on them and try to tell me about Jesus. I might not listen to them anyways. He said, Lord, what will thou have me do? And the Lord said immediately, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee. What? Oh, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> that's not what I said. You just asked me what to do. I just told you what to do. Are you going to do what I told you? Well, Paul didn't argue with him. He just goes in the city. They lead him into the city, and he goes. Paul claims Christ. Now, here's the problem with most of us. Paul, Paul got it right here. He acknowledged Christ in, in the last. Take your Bibles, go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter, actually, yeah, 3. Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. But you got, you got to accept him. you got to claim him. And it's something each person has to do. 3 verse 8. Yea, doubtless, this is Paul talking again. You ever wonder why Paul was a great Christian? You ought to read some of the things he says. Yea, doubtless, and I yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. My Lord. It's no longer the Lord, it is mine. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. Is he yours? Is Jesus Christ your Lord today? Or are you your Lord? Or is somebody else your Lord? Now, this world is an insane place, if you haven't really realized it yet. Uh, we have some of the most strangest things going on in this country that you have, and it's really going on around the world. Uh, we got elections coming up, and uh, I, uh, the kids, Elizabeth ordered some stuff from Bible Baptist, and, and they threw in one of Doc's old uh, uh, bulletins, and it was from like 1992, 93. I was actually in school when that bulletin was printed. And uh, I opened it up, and Donald Trump is in that bulletin uh, talking about his uh, wickedness out in California or out in Las Vegas and all the hotels and all the, the bars and everything he has. And he still has them off. You go out there, Trump, Trump real estate, he owns all kinds of stuff. And uh, right now we got a man who, who is in charge of the Miss America, which that means your daughters are out there naked walking up and down the the, the runway, that's, they get there. But if, they can't, if you can't get them there because of Miss America, you take them to the Miss, Miss uh, Universe, I think, and then Miss America, and then Miss Teen, and then all the way up. So you destroy your kids, you pervert them, and they think that they got to be part of that garbage. That's Donald Trump. And uh, he, he may well be the next president of the United States. But you look at the other choices you have, you don't have much of a choice on any. I mean, you got Hillary or Sanders, or you got Cruz or... Or, uh, well, they're almost pretty much all out, and they're trying to get Trump out of there. Uh, but I'm telling you, when you look at your, your leadership, you look at your leadership, it's not there. It's perverted. And we're sitting there, you can't even, and you judge, you make judgments according to what that is. And we try, brother, I'm telling you what, you, I, I was in the Navy, I'm a chief, I got my little card, I don't have it on me now, I don't have my wallet, but uh, I've got a card, I'm a chief, I'm a retired chief. I would never tell anybody to send their kids in the military. I would never tell you to send your kids into anything government. When that lady over at that school system would not take a track out of my hand because she was afraid something was going to happen to her. She wanted to get saved, too. You can see it in her eyes. She was on school property. This was a lady who would not even take a gospel track and stick it in her pocket. She was afraid, afraid the government was. Your government's wicked as hell. Right. Now, I'll tell you, it tells me to obey them that have the rule over me. So I'll do everything they tell me. They just sent my taxes back and said, you got to change some things. We're going to change them, send it back to them. They sent it back and said, if you don't get nothing, you owe us money, then I'll pay them money. I'll do whatever they say. I'll pay my taxes over on Grange Hall. i pay my mortgage. i pay everything I can possibly pay. Uh, and then Beth says, we ain't got no money. But we just keep paying and we paying and paying. And then if we have to, we'll sell what we got and we'll move down. We'll downsize. I'll get me one of those little houses like Eric's talking about that you put behind a trailer and you just haul it behind your car. That'll force my girls out, man. That'll force them at that point. They'll have to find some place to live. <laughs> Paul, Paul claimed Christ. It says, yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Do you count all things but lost? Do you still cling to things in this world? They mean something to you. You know what, what you ought to do? You got to sit down sometimes and look at your flesh and say, ah, my flesh wants this. Uh, my spirit says no, but my flesh says yeah, but my spirit. And all you got to do is say, 
would Jesus do this? Then that's the flesh, if he wouldn't. But if he would do this, sometimes all of her stuff is over here, so it's kind of hard to tell. I mean, you got to find something that you put on Jesus' side. So, you, so take your time, man. Find something that you actually put on Jesus' side so you know what's actually on Jesus' side. Because if all your stuff is on the world's side and you say, well, uh, let me say this or that, and I choose that, well, you're still on the same side. You haven't moved off of it. Now, you got to get in your Bibles and find out what Christ wants you to do. But he says, all things for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. It isn't Jesus is Lord. It's Christ Jesus, my Lord. I made him my Lord 35 years ago, and I've been trying to find a way to serve him ever since. It's getting rougher. Why preach Jesus? The manifestation number two, the manifestation of the method of preaching was not Paul's but God's. God told Paul what to do. He says in verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, it says, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. You know, sometimes you got to examine yourself. The Bible says examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. you got to look inside. you got to look inside. Say, okay, Lord, is this pleasing to you? And, and sometimes we're dishonest to God. We're dishonest to him. And God said, you can't be dishonest, Paul. you got to be honest. Uh, Paul did not like going to tell everybody, that, hey, but everybody knew he's out killing Christians. Paul didn't like that. But that was something that came up. But Paul's life overcame all that, and he ref his, the reflection of his life soon became evident to everybody that God did save him. You know, Jesus Christ has plenty of mercy. He has plenty of grace. Uh, he loves us. He loves us beyond. See, we don't have grace with each other sometimes. So we don't care. We don't care about anybody else. All we care about is ourselves. It's not about you. Remember this. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus Christ, the Lord, Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. The manifestation of the method of the preaching was not Paul's but God's. He said, get rid of your dishonesty. Not walking. Don't be crafty. Don't be sly and sneaky. Be open, open as you can possibly be. Everybody, your, your life should be an open book in front of everybody. If you're doing something that's not pleasing to God, quit it. Because what you're doing is you're affecting other people. At that point, what you're doing is you're caring about yourself and not the other people around you. Jesus Christ didn't care about anybody else. He, he cared about himself. He's God. He can do that. But when he did anything, everything he did was right. Not handling the word of God deceitfully. When you pick up the book and it tells you to do something, do it. Don't try to make somebody else do something you wouldn't do. If the book says something, don't try to cover it up. Don't go and get an RSV, ASV, something else to hide what you... I, I, the Jehovah Witness, you know what they do? They want to prove that Jesus Christ and Satan were brothers, so what they do is they get a New World Translation. They translate one of the new puke versions, and it says, or in John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God. They add an article, so they can get it to say what they want it to say. Leave it alone. Amen. All you got to do is do what it says. See, it's hard. Why preach Jesus? Because he told us to. It was his manif manifestation of the truth. He said, by, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man. This is God's way. Man's conscience in the sight of God. You know, you should be commending yourself to everybody around you. Your life should be sticking out like a sore thumb before them. If not, get out of the way and let somebody else do it. I tell, I tell all the time, man, I, if I could have quit this job a long time ago, I'd have quit it. I tried five or six times. I tried to give this church to John Mister. He laughed at me. I tried five or six preachers. Nobody wanted it. God said, you're going to do it. I said, Lord. He goes, shut up. I said, okay. You want to take it up with God? Go for it. I've done done it. I've done it and done it and done it and done it and done it. You think I think I should be here? No, I don't. I think somebody more holy and more pure should be here reading the word of God. I think that. God says, shut up and do it. You know what our problem is? Is we, won't, we don't want to do what God tells us to do. Because it's too hard. Of course it's hard. I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. You ought to sit on, I sit there and listen to these other preachers preach and all that. I'm like, Lord, I'm not like them guys. They all got masters and bachelors and triple doctorates and all this other stuff. I'm like, Lord, I barely got a high school education. The Lord said, shut up. I told you to do it. I said, I'm going to keep on doing it. I sit back there in the back, man, saying, Lord, this ain't going to fly well. It's not going to fly well. He says, shut up and do it. I said, okay. And then all of a sudden, you all sing a song or Lynn will pick a song out or somebody will sing a song, and it's like right down the line where God says go, and I'm thinking, okay, I'll shut up. It may not come out too good to them, but I'm going to do it anyways. Number one, number one, Paul acknowledged God. Number two, Paul accepted the claim. He claimed Christ. Then, then it said the ministry, I said the ministry, the ministry was given and mercy received. 
the manifestation of the method of preaching wasn't why I preach. I'm getting to some reasons why, of how you preach. I'm going to get into a, a why you preach in just a second. You have to identify, if you're going to preach, the menace against preaching, you're going to have to identify that menace. If you don't, you'll quit. He says, faint not at the beginning of that verse up there. Take your Bibles, go back to Acts, or uh, uh, yeah, Colossians, Col Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 4, wherever we were a little while ago. It was in the Bible somewhere. Just pick a spot, and I'll just read it, and we'll go from there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 3 says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So there's a way to hide the gospel. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The menace against the preaching has to be identified. Uh, if you do not identify the menace, you're not going to learn how to preach. You're not going to be bringing the gospel up. What you've got to do is, well, I preach Christ uh, because if you don't, the menace is going to overcome. Now, I talked about the government a few minutes ago. And the government, your government wants to control your life. And it wants to control every facet it can control. Uh, I'm not a, a conspiracy theorist. I think there's a great conspiracy. I think the God of this world is controlling the whole thing. And he don't care whether the United States goes up or down. He don't care whether Russia goes up or down. He don't care whether nothing. As long as he can destroy every Christian that he can, keep God from being promoted, and, and take Israel out. That's what he's trying to do. Anything beyond that's fair game. He could care less. If America wants to fight with China, fine. If you want to argue that you got the best aircraft carriers and England doesn't, fine. Do whatever you want to do. Just don't get saved and don't serve Jesus Christ. Don't care anything else. So your job, he wants your job. He wants to control your life. He'll do it with your job. He'll do it with your finances, and he'll do it with your fa fa family. You know what most pro families' problems are? Is they don't get in control of what's going on in the family, and then it gets so far out there that nobody knows how to bring it back in. It has to be done gradually delicately, slowly. If you kids, young people, Andrew's getting ready to have a kid, a little girl. Some of the other families in there got, Zach's got a little baby right now. What you got to do is you got to say, okay, how am I going to raise that child right now all the way through? Well, I haven't done so good in my own life. All right, then stop it and straighten that thing out and raise those children right so they have a chance. If you don't, they won't. If you don't put the school system, the government is out there right now to spend 40 or 50 hours a week in these kids and do everything they can to take your kids away from you and train them the way they want them trained, not the way you want to train them. So you better be putting in 40 hours in their life of God somewhere. You better be doing that. Uh, your job, your finances, you ought to get your finances under control. You can never serve God unless you get your finances under control. I had a preacher one time say this. He said, if people come up and ask me, and they do all the time ask me for money, if they smoke, if they drink, if they got pets, you ain't getting 10 cents out of my pocket. You understand that? You get rid of your stinking drinking and your smoking and your pets, and then come tell me and I'll help you feed your family. If you got a pet and you can feed a dog, you got a problem. You got a cat, you feed the dog. Cat, quit feeding the cat, get rid of the cat, and take care of your family. I think that was Jack Woods. He's a little skinny, scrawny guy, man, but he had big guys around him all the time, man. They'd just beef you up if you said anything. Or Jack Woods would just shoot you. But see, we sit there and say, oh, I ain't got no money. What are you doing with what you got? Are you living outside your means? Are you wasting it? Are you doing the wrong things? Don't say you ain't got no money if the money you got you're spending it the wrong way. But that's Satan. What he'll do is he'll get you financially broke. Scientists. The scientists, the scientific community wants to control your thoughts. So you got the government on one side trying to control your life, and science is trying to control your thoughts. I don't know if y'all ever, uh, I was talking to him yesterday at the prayer breakfast about CERN over in, it's right on the Geneva, it's in Geneva, Switzerland, and France. And they're, they've got a uh, superconductor over there, it's an LHC, it's, uh, they're, they're, they're colliding, it's a collider, they're colliding protons. And, and they get one stream going one way and another stream going the other way, and however, I don't know if you can do that and do this at the same time, whatever. But, but anyways, they're over there trying to uh, collide them, and they are. Uh, you got uh, the, I forget the guy's name, uh, that little... And, and if they do that, uh, he's afraid they're going to create a black hole and it's going to suck the planet in, which is okay with me. Because uh, <laughs> we'll all go home. It, it's like a flood. This time, you get rid of Noah, you get rid of everything. You get rid of the planet. You never, God won't even start over. He'll build another one. In Revelation uh, 21, he builds another one anyways. But they want your beliefs. They want to tell you that God don't exist. 
What they've done over there is the reason they want to collide these, these protons is because they say there's something beyond the protons. Now, brother, I'm telling you, they spent 30 years. There's some of them old guys who spent 30 years to get to this place where they could collide those protons to see the, the test equipment that had to be designed. Now, this entire thing, it wasn't just colliding. The collider isn't even the problem. Now they have to have something that can see that happening. So now they have to build these big old test equipment of monitors that when they drop them down and they run it through and, and they actually collide, they can see what's colliding. And then they tell you what's happening. And what they said, which is an amazing thing, but they said that when they collided, you get all these particles come out, and they had identified all of them, but this one in the middle, it's called a Higgs uh, boson, a Higgs boson, right in the center, right there. They call that the God particle, if you never heard of the God particle. That's right there in the middle of this thing. They said that thing holds all that together. <laughs> they don't know why. And they, they got a real problem right now where it's supersymmetry or uh, multiverse. And they have this problem. They say, well, if it's supersymmetry, that means that in our galaxy, everything is sym symmetrical and it's all in order and, and it's there and it's held together by some that, that Higgs, Higgs boson, boson and, it, and it ain't going to fall apart. They said, but if this thing ever falls apart, the entire universe goes away. I'm like, hey, I got a Bible that says that, too. And, uh, and then they go, well, but the multiverse, and this is, they're having this problem. Now, these are men who spent 30 years and who knows how many college education, bachelor's, master's degrees, doctorates, and all this other stuff. Four or 5,000 of them, and then all over the planet, everybody, education without salvation is damnation. They're fools. They're fools. Multiverse goes, well, if, if it's not, if this little spike doesn't go up to this level, then it's multiverse, but if it, do, it, do, if it doesn't go up that level and it's down here, then it's, it's both, you idiot, it's both. He goes, there could be universes outside our universe. I'm like, no kidding. <laughs> Have you ever read Genesis 1? And you sit there and look at these idiots, and they sit there and they spent their whole lives going through this thing to realize they have no idea what's next. I'm like, you're stupid. Now, if you're in, in science, I am not ridiculing, because I mean, we take science to build cars. I understand that, and the mathematics and everything else. But what, what blows me out of the water is they sit there and look at this thing, and this one old guy was walking, and he goes, he goes it's just amazing how nature can be put into a mathematical formula. And a mathematical formula can be put on a piece of paper. I said, no, 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 what's amazing to me is that you're such an idiot that you don't see the, the, the complexity of that thing right there and how organized it is. It's not chaotic, it's organized. And outside this universe, in the multi-universe, which I believe is there, I believe in this one and that one, somebody's holding this one all together like it's supposed to be. And the ones out there could be all crazy all over the place. I don't really care because he's holding them together like they're supposed to be too. I don't really care. They say, but if you leave here, you can't live there. Oh, yes, I can. He done told me how to do it. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That means once I leave here, I'll get whatever it takes to go there. <laughs> and you spend, this old guy was sitting there going, I spent my whole life and in my lifetime, I got to watch them go like that and see it a little thing on a screen. And then he's going to retire. And the guy goes, you can't retire like this is. No, the guy's ready to retire. He spent his whole life to do that, and he'll never know what is after that. Yeah. I picked up a Bible in 1980 and, and started reading the thing, and I found all the answers I ever need. Amen. When I get up to heaven, I'll find the God particle. It's the name Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the creator of everything. Yeah. He said, I'll make something that they don't know what's there. Well, they don't know what a black hole is or dark matter. They're idiots. They keep scrapping it. Why don't you just believe what the book says? Don't want it. Don't want it. Science. Science. And now I'm saying, all oh, that say this, you send your kids to school and you wonder why they come home with no brains? <laughs> Do you really want to know that? That's what you're doing. And they come home. But see what they're doing is they, somebody's giving them the mathematical equations in their heads so they can write this stuff down to keep them going another little piece, another little piece, another little piece until they walk off. These people are dying and going to hell left and right. And that, that collider over there is still going. And they're going to bring it back on this year. That's what Hawkins all worried about. Because when they fire it up this year, they're going to have double the power. I don't really care. It doesn't bother me at all. I do think our government actually did something right one time. Because they were going to have one down in Houston, Texas that was going to be bigger than that one. 
And some senator, I said, this is stupid, man. Why are we spending that kind of money on that? I mean, we ought to, you know, get ice cream or something. Uh, <laughs> what a waste. Five billion dollars to build that thing. Five billion dollars right down the tubes. And, and all the people, and they're all going through this thing, and they still have no answer at the end of it. I'm thinking no answer at the end, and that's what we're doing. The government wants to control your life. Scientists, community wants to uh, get your beliefs and your understanding. And they're all trying to hinder you from preaching, from preaching. Why preach? I'm going to get to that in just a second. Hang on there. Don't go away. The entertainment industry controls your time. Don't tell me you don't. That's everything. That's everything. That's Hollywood. That's Donald Trump's entertainment, too. Uh, so is Cruz. Cruz, them guys are getting in on the game. And, and Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton. They're a bunch of liars. And you trust them. Bernie Sanders was never, never, never with me on health care. Then they show two pictures where he's standing right behind her in 1992 on, on health care, and she sends him a note saying, thank you for all the help on health care. <laughs> they are liars. You know how you know they're liars? Their lips move. Just because somebody says God does not make them a Christian... Just because somebody says, I'm a Christian, does not mean they're a servant of Jesus Christ. My mom does that all the time. Well, Obama said God. I mean, last week she hated him because he, he never said nothing. He said God. So that means he's, I said, you're an idiot, mom. <laughs> if you're watching this, I love you. <laughs> I do, man. I tell my mom, man, we go do that stuff all the time. I got a book. The book tells me everything I want to, I want to know. I have to do what the book says. I have no choice. I have no choice. The entertainment wants to control. Philemon, Philemon, Philemon 123 says this. Uh, therefore, now see, I'm going to tell you. You, you. Listen to this. Listen. You don't have to turn there, but listen. Therefore, uh, there, uh, there salute the Ephratus, my fellow in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow labors. Uh, later on down the line, 2 Timothy 4.10, something happened to Demas. Demas had forsaken me having loved this present world. Something got into Demas's crawl, and Demas went away from Paul the truth. You know, if you don't watch out, something will get in your crawl. And you'll walk away from God before you ever learn what you're supposed to do for him. Satan is on you 24-7 to get you to go. He's on your wife. He's on your you. He's on your kids. He's on your car. He's on everything you got, man. There is, I mean, I come over here and stuff breaks all the time. And I'm like, you can't fix this fast enough for that not to break in that. And then you got to go home and fix everything. I walk in the house and says, can you do this, 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 And my kids say, can you do that, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And then pretty soon I just want to go jump in my car and go to California. <laughs> I got the church credit card. I can get out there anyways <laughs> before you catch me. <laughs> but I'm telling you, brethren, if you don't watch out, you will quit. And he, the very first verse here says, we faint not. He goes, therefore, seeing we have this ministry. God wants to give you a ministry. He wants to give you something that only you can do that is more important than anything else on the face of this planet. What Satan wants to do is put other things in front of that to make those things look important and these things not important. I'd like to get to my last part right here. Well, the multitudes. The multitudes uh, that need preaching are at stake. He says right there in verse 4, In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest they, the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You know what's hindering the gospel going out? Us. It's in our power. It's in our grips. Amen. We have it. But I'd rather do this than that. We make that decision. You make that decision. You'll make a decision today. You're making one right now. I want to serve Jesus Christ, and I'll get anything out of my life that's displeasing to him or... But I like this, 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 and this, and, and I'll, I'll put him in over here, and I'll give him this much time. I used to know guys who try to give him this much time, and then they do everything else they want and give him this much time. That don't work. That's not Lord of your life. That is Jesus and me. I don't like the Jesus and me thing. I like it just Jesus. I'm just trying to find out where he wants me to put my next foot, and that's where I want to go. I'd like to say this, and then I'm done. Down in, down in verse 5, I'm going to get back to my verse. For we preach not ourselves. Everything that I just went through is yourself. You preach yourself. And all that stuff, he's trying to keep you from preaching yourself. It has nothing to do with you. Paul says, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. God has set up Jesus Christ, and why? 
Why I preach Jesus Christ the Lord? Because there's nobody else better to preach. I'm telling you right now, there's nobody else. I like my song book because I can take my song book and I can open it up. And this is all just right off the cuff. I'm going to have to off the cuff somewhere else. <laughs> you have longed for sweet peace. Have you ever? Have you ever longed for sweet peace? Have you? Man, have you ever been there somewhere where you're just miserable and you thought, well, I'll just go get me a physics book. Yeah, man, that'll solve my problem. <laughs> physics, yeah, physics. I'll go get me a book on Betty Crocker, how to cook. Man, that'll solve my problem. No, I ain't got no food in the refrigerator. That makes it worse. <laughs> no, man, I, I pick up a song book. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase. And have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Flip the page. Uh, a friend I have called Jesus whose love is strong and true and never fails however it is tried no matter what I do I've sinned against this love of his but when I knelt to pray I can't read no more <laughs> confessing all my guilt to him the sin cloud rolled away. You don't get that nowhere else. Right. Nowhere, 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 nowhere. Nowhere. That thing right there, get that in my Bible, man. You can keep all the rest of the books on this planet. I don't care no more. This right, you can keep all the commentaries. I want this right here in my Bible. That's all I need. And some halls and some shoe polish. That's what Jack Hollis said. He gave a picture of some gum. So the perfect preacher had all these things with him. We preach Jesus Christ the Lord. Why? Because God said to do it, man. Because God had made him Christ, Jesus the Lord. Peter said in Acts 2, 36, and I'm almost done. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He is Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. He's Christ the Lord. <laughs> He's Christ Jesus Christ the Lord. He's God manifest the flesh. Amen. He's master. You know what the Lord means? Lord means master. Is he your master today? You know what our problem is today? We just have, we worry about too much other stuff. I don't care if they come take everything I got away. I could care less. You know, Jesus, before the foundation of the world, knew what I was going to have today. He knew what I was thinking today. He knew what I'm going to think tomorrow. He knows what you're thinking right now. Before the foundation of the world, before you were ever, before anybody, before Adam and Eve, before anything ever happened, he already knew what I was going to be doing right now. He already knew it. He already knew it. He's my master. He's my mediator. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You know when I got a problem, I can get down and say, oh, Lord, I did it again. He goes, yeah, you did. I knew this before the foundation of the world. Isn't that crazy? He already knows what you've done. He already knows what you're going to do. And he's got enough mercy and grace that he loves you enough that he's going to forgive you for it. What a God, man. You wonder why he made him the Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> Christ is the Messiah. You get over to Daniel, it says the Messiah will come. Talking about over in uh, the book of Revelation. He's coming back. The Messiah is coming. And when he comes, you better watch out. He's sovereign. The Lord is sovereign. Master and sovereign. Jesus is mediator and substitute. Christ is Messiah and Savior. You say, why? Why is he? Because he's Lord over life. There's nothing in your life. See, we worry about the wrong things. You know why you preach Jesus? Because this world needs to hear about Jesus. They don't need to hear about no CERN thing over there blowing the, I hope it does I hope that you don't think I'm crazy I hope it does create a black hole I hope it sucks this planet right in because about five minutes later it can't do that by the way because we still got to go through the tribulation and we still got to get into revelation chapter 20 and he's still got to throw Satan into hell and he's still got to have a white throne judgment and he's still got to blow everything up himself I don't think he's going to give us the privilege to do that <laughs> he's been waiting a long time to do that and he's going to do it you can hang it up. I don't care what they say because they're a bunch of buffoons is what they are. He's Lord over life. Why won't you give him your life? You cannot do it any better than he does. You can't do it. He's Lord over death. He's unproved that, man. He come back up out of the grave. You know anybody who's done that? Yeah. I mean, been in the ground for like three or four days. Not only that, he did that a couple times. He did that with Lazarus and the lady in the woman in name, uh, the widow in name. I mean, when she brought her son out, he brought him. 
Now, I, I'm going to get to heaven. I said, I said, Lord, shouldn't you have asked her first if he wanted you? She wanted him back. <laughs> she made it say, just could I get my husband instead of him? I mean, that boy's caused me some trouble. But the Lord knew. The Lord knew. And he brought her, that girl back to life. He brought that son back to life. He brought Lazarus out of the tomb. I'm a firm believer. I heard old preacher say that one time. I'm a firm believer that. When he said, Lazarus, come forth. The only reason he said Lazarus is so everybody in that graveyard didn't get up. I think they'd all got right up and come right on in, man. And he'd had a big old problem, man, because he wasn't ready. It, he wasn't ready for the tribulation and to blow the place up yet. <laughs> He's got a timetable, man. I see our problem is it's not your timetable. It's his. Amen. Brethren, the hardest thing you'll ever do is learn to get into his timetable, not yours. You try to do everything your way, and you're going to mess it up. I can't, I can't help you, though, man. I, I'm struggling just trying to get mine in the right place. And, to, and tell you we're, we're all messing up. But I'm just messing up like you are. He's the Lord of the Elements. I mean, here's the scientists over there. We need to acquire these particles and spend $5 billion. The Lord said, hey, you got a couple of loaves and some fishes I can have? A little, little boy comes and says, sure, man. And you're talking about making protons. I mean, I mean, you really think about that right there? He takes five loaves and two fishes and feeds 12,000. Now, there's some multiplying there, man. I mean, we're talking some atomic sub-level multiplying all over the place. And he didn't need no uh, proton collider. Let's build this collider first, and we're going to throw the bread in here, and we'll throw the fishes in on time. When they collide, they'll just blow up. No. <laughs> he just said, give me the fishes. Father, I'll make these things like everywhere. And they were. That's exactly, you know, that's like, that's this little bitty thing like when he was sitting in heaven and there was no universe, and he goes, poof, there it was. The whole universe sit out in front of him. That's God. That's Jesus Christ, by the way. That, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, was God. In the, beginning was, in the beginning was something. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and I mean, he made it all, brother. He didn't play no games. He didn't need science. He didn't need Einstein. He didn't need none of them. He didn't need CERN. I like to meet that senator who shut the one down here in Houston. That's a wise move. The only problem is they probably spent $4.9 billion down there on it, and he stopped it before they put, like, the last three cents in. <laughs> He's Lord over the elements. He's Lord over heaven. You get over to Revelation. When he walks into heaven, they all bow. The angels, everything. Who are you? Who are you? When was the last time you bowed your knees before Jesus Christ? You personally. You personally somewhere. I don't care if it's in a closet. You get down somewhere and say, oh, God, I'm just a wicked. When was the last time you did that? The angels do. You're going to go to heaven one day. You're going to stand there. Michael and hey, Gabriel are going to be just like this in front of God. <laughs> and you're going to be standing there going, why are they doing that? Because <laughs> you never did it here. And when they knock you down, you're going to know you got knocked down. I love you too, man. <laughs> I'm trying to warn you to keep you out of trouble when you get there. He's the Lord over heaven. He's the Lord over hell. I like that, man. I like Luke 16, 19. He walked right through that place. What is it to him anyways? I had a guy yell at me one time. Big Baptist church yell at me. Jesus Christ didn't go to hell for me. Then you're lost and on your way to hell. He either went to hell for you or he didn't. When he went to hell, he paid for all the sins of the mankind that could ever be even committed. He paid for sin. He's the Lord over the grave. He popped back up. Nobody else could do what he's done. Why I preach Jesus? Because nobody can do what he did. Isaiah said his name is Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And Matthew, Peter said, he said unto them, Christ talks to him. He sometimes asks. He asks us questions. Christ, said, Christ ever asked you a question? I said at the beginning of this saying, you have to make him your Lord. Paul said, my Lord. He says, Jesus Christ, my Lord. You've got to make him your Lord. When was the last time you made him his Lord? You know, today we're going to have an altar call in a few minutes. You might just want to make him your Lord today. You say, well, I got saved. Yeah, but did you just get saved to get out of hell, or did you get saved... To make him your Lord. That's the purpose of the whole thing. It's about him, not you. He said unto them, Peter, he said, Whom say ye that I am? I like Peter, man. Peter's got some guts. And Simon Peter answered before he goes to denounce him three times, before he calls him all kinds of stuff and cusses him and everything else. Simon Peter answers and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but boy, that excites me. I, have, I don't have no book, and I don't have no Bible. I know there's things written down in, in heaven that's being written down about us right now. I, the 66 books are done. This is done. There, nothing can be added to this. Nothing can be subtracted from this. This is all about Peter here. Uh, my stuff, I'll get up in heaven. 
But Jesus answered and said, could you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ and said, blessed are thou. Well, I mean, you get a blessed are thou out of Jesus Christ's mouth, you done done something good. <laughs> I mean, you done done something good. You know how you get that? You make him the Lord of your life. You know what Peter did? He made him the Lord of his life. John, John 1.29, uh, John the Baptist said, the next day John see uh, Jesus coming and said unto him, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Amen. I must decrease, he must increase. He's got to come up. I got to go down. I was just here for a precursor for him. And he gets thrown into prison and, and get all tested and beat up and stuff. And John's sitting there worried and said, did I mess up and think double, double taking everything he's ever done? And was that really him? Was that really him? He's my cousin, but was that really him? He sent somebody, are you really him? He said, go tell him, man. Go tell him. <laughs> and he comes back and you know why? Why I preach Jesus? Because he's the son of God. He is Jesus Christ, the Lord. He is the Lord of your, is he? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Is he the Lord of your life? Daily, daily. When you make decisions, is he the Lord of your life? Is he the Lord of your affairs? What you do, is he a Lord of that? Does he have your finances? Does he have your family? Does he have your possessions? Or are they still yours? If they're yours, he's not the Lord of your life. Now, brother, this is not Lordship salvation. I believe once saved, always saved. You can't lose it if you try it. But I do think that you'll make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life or you won't. And you'll never see him do the things that he does in this book unless you do that. You can see this stuff. I'm telling you, brother, I've seen some weird stuff in, in the last 35 years. I've watched him do things in my life. i watched me do things that I should have never done. There's a song that says, Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heaven anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as the matchless king throughout eternity. Now, that's where we're going to be one day. But you can do that down here. Crown him the Lord of life who triumphed over the grave and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring and lives that death may die. Crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him. Lord of love, behold his hands inside, those wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear the sight, but uh, downward bends his burning eyes uh, at mystery so sight, uh, bright. Crown him the Lord of heaven. Crown him the Lord of heaven, enthroned in worlds above. Crown him the king to whom it's given the wondrous name of love. Crown him, I crown, I ain't gonna sing the rest of it, I can't. Have you crowned him your king? You know, why, you know why it says there in that verse, it says, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord? Because you don't need to hear about me. You need to hear about him. Is he the Lord of your life? Father, we thank you for your many blessings today. Thank you for all you've done so far today. Lord, some of us just need to come forward and just uh, make you back the Lord of our lives. And Lord, put our lives in your hands and let you guide and direct it. Lord, I know uh, I've been trying for 35 years, and I've had to correct a lot of things, still correcting things, Father, and I just pray that you keep putting them in our paths. Lord, there's young people in here, uh, Lord, that don't have to correct a lot. They could just go on and move with you forward, and, Lord, you could use them mightily. Lord, this world, Satan, the God of this world, wants to t destroy their lives before they ever get started. Uh, Lord, I thank you for a church, Father, where preachers will get up here and preach and, and teach the Word of God, and, Father, hopefully we'll get through to these uh, young kids and the older, uh, us older people also, Lord. Uh, Father, that you can use us in these last days. Father, there's a mighty uh, work to be done. It still needs to be completed. You need uh, uh, workers in the field. Uh, Lord, help us to see that you are the Lord of our lives and that you can direct and guide our steps and that we can trust you. Uh, Lord, thank you for the mercy and grace and thank you for salvation. Uh, Lord, help to guide and direct our lives. And we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Number 124.